Hi again, friends. Let's continue with lean principles. And again, I recommend you have that PDF assessment uh, document in front of you as we go through, through these. Um, the fourth principle is focusing on the process rather than the person. And one of my favorite quotes from Dr. Deming, he said, 95% of quality problems are in the process, not the person. And 95% of the times we blame the person and don't fix the process and can't figure out why we still have the problem. The problem is in the process. And it relieves a lot of stress in the organization, a lot of friction, a lot of blaming, if you practice that, if you teach people that what we have to focus on is improving the process. And that doesn't mean nobody's ever to blame or nobody's ever accountable. But when somebody has failed to do something, you look around them and say, well, what, what is it that caused them to fail? What, what, did they not have the training? Did they not have the information? Do they, do they not have the motivation? Do they not care? And that's all process around the person. Rarely is it that the person is a bad person. I mean, I guess that happens sometimes, but it's, it's pretty rare. So let's focus on the process and high quality organizations, lean organizations, are process knowledgeable. That means teams are organized around the process. Every team owns some part of the process. Every team has ownership of a process. The entire process is owned, meaning somebody is responsible for every step in the process. And people are working on continuously improving the process. Map your process. Uh, there, there's some magic. I, I can't explain the chemistry, but there's chemistry to it. Put the process on the wall, map it, use you know, post-it notes, look at all the steps. I recommend you use what I call a relationship map. This is a relationship map, and it, it, the, the lines on it are the who, right? So you can see how the process flows across different people. And there, it's in chronological order, so it flows from left to right. And, and it, it can raise questions like, why is this person involved? And believe me, I've had cases where I did a process mapping with the senior management team of a division. And the head of the division was in a process three times, uh, which the team had just mapped. And I asked the leader of the division, who was sitting in the room, I said, what value do you add to this process? And he said, I have no idea what value I add to this process, and I don't know why I'm in it. And I, you know why he was in it? Because you know, five years ago, somebody screwed up, and he said, don't ever do that again. And he's been in the process checking on it ever since, and nobody remembers why. Uh, processes develop like that. Bad habits in an organization develop that way. They're not intelligent, they're not intentional, they're not designed, which is why we're going to design our process to, processes to be capable, right? Often we want people to do things and we want our organization to achieve things, to execute a strategy where the process is simply not capable of executing that strategy or performing in the way we want it to perform. So we have to study the process. Within every process there is process capability. Okay? And it's a good you know, sort of statistical understanding, and I, I use the example of a gun, which I know some people don't like, but if you shoot it and there's a, there's a target, um, and you have it aimed perfectly at the bullseye of the target, will every time you shoot it, will it hit the bullseye if you're, let's say, 100 yards from the target? No, there'll be a pattern that it will form around, right? And every gun, depending on the length of the barrel and some other things, has a capability some, some will produce a pattern this way, and some will produce a pattern that way. A 38 Special, Snub Nose 38, is going to produce a big, wide pattern. And I don't care how much you yell and scream at the operator of that machine, it will not produce a pattern that looks like this at 100 yards. I don't care how many times they, in fact, every time they move the gun, they're going to increase the variability of the process. So every process, every machine, and every operation, whether it's a human or a machine operation, has capability. We need to know what the capability is of our processes. And then we have to examine the process and say, why is it capable of producing the way it's producing? Every process is producing exactly the way it's capable of producing. So if we want to change the performance, we have to change the nature of the process, which means 
changing the capability of the process. So map your process, put it on the wall, make sure everybody knows what that process is, and within each step you derive from that standard work that is performed by, by each employee. So that processes become standardized and they become the basis for continuous improvement. Mr. Ono of Toyota said there can be no continuous improvement without standardization of work and processes. So we first have to standardize the process. We have to know our process. And you would be surprised how often we don't know what our process is. And this, I'm sorry to say, senior managers, is most true the higher you go in the organization. I was working with a very large company. I won't even mention the industry at this point. Um, but I was meeting with their senior team, and it was time for their annual strategy development process. Exercise, I should say, not process, because they didn't have a process. And they began to talk about how to do it. And I, as sort of their coach, said, well, how did you do it last year, and what worked and what didn't work? And they sort of started fumbling around, yeah, well, how did, what do we, who did that? Who did, what did we do last year? And I said, you know, this is a process that you do every year, right? They said, yeah, that's right. Well, wouldn't it make sense to sort of know what your process is and study that process and improve that process? Because I'm sure every year, if you do a post-development analysis, you can improve the process. And then you'll do it better the next year and, and so forth. And they said, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so we mapped the process. You know, we just went to the board and we got the post-it notes and, you know, we did the lines of who's involved and talked about why different people are involved. But it is very often true that senior management teams do not know what their processes are and they don't know how they add value as a team and the way they add value as a team by knowing their processes and doing their processes well. So standardize your process, make your process maps visible. The first significant book on lean management in the Western world was The Machine That Changed the World by Womack and others, a group from MIT. And in it, they said that if you examine lean factories, the heart of the lean factory is the work team the work team that is engaged in continuous improvement and owns their work. That's the heart of a lean factory. It's also the heart of lean healthcare or lean any other kind of organization. The heart of every society to go to larger cultures is that family unit. The team in the workplace is the family unit of the organization. It is the learning organization. It's the first learning mechanism for every employee is that team. If your teams are not functioning well, you will not achieve high performance. Um, two kinds of teams, and I think this, this illustrates it. There are the natural work teams, and this is um, uh, Jeff Likers, uh, who wrote the, the, um, Toyota, the Toyota Way and Toyota Culture and Toyota Leadership. This is his way of illustrating teams in the Toyota plant. Um, this is how I've illustrated teams for many, many, many years. Just they're the same thing, just one's turned upside down. Um, but nevertheless, um, teams follow the process. Teams run from top to bottom in the organization. And I would go back to the 1970s. I was working in textile mills with Fran Tarkenton and Aubrey Daniels in South Carolina and Georgia and Alabama. And we go into uh, a textile plant and we get the supervisor to lead his crew, his shift, in a weekly team meeting where they went over their data. And we worked hard to get that supervisor to ask questions, not dictate, um, to help them understand their data, to you know, ask them what can we do this week to improve it, to engage in just the very basic team sol problem solving improvement process. And it worked. But what we quickly learned was if that supervisor went into his meeting that week with the department manager, and the department manager practiced none of those skills, but instead pointed fingers and dictated and beat them up, he would not, the supervisor would not continue doing that with his team. It is a, it's just a fact 
of all cultural life in every culture. We model the behavior of significant others above. Those above must set the model. Senior managers must set the model for those below, the plant manager in a manufacturing environment. His or her team must work in the same way you want teams to work below. So don't just implement teams on the shop floor. That will not last. It will not work. It's got to be implemented at every level in the organization. Two kinds of teams, natural work and management teams. And then there are problem solving or Kaizen teams, if you like, that are cross-functional. There, there are some problems that cannot be solved within the control of a single team. And therefore, it needs to be referred to a continuous improvement or Kaizen team that is a problem-solving group that's formed from people from different teams with different kinds of knowledge and experience who can address that problem. Those are temporary teams. They'll go away after making a recommendation for how to improve that, that process. The, the permanent teams are the natural work teams and the management teams. You need both. It's not that one is right and one is wrong. They're absolutely both right. You must design the team process to empower employees and so that they know they're empowered to experiment, to make improvements in their process. And initially, employees will tend to not believe that. They will not believe that we can actually change something to experiment and make improvement. And if the first time they experiment to make an improvement and it doesn't work, you punish them, you will kill it. So consult with them, coach them, help them learn to look at their data, problem solve, and experiment. Lean is the elimination of waste in all of its forms. Now, in the sort of classic Toyota production, thinking there are seven, I'll call them traditional, forms of waste, work in process, rework, et cetera. Um, you should look at all those when you look at your process. When you study your process, you should look at you know, where is waste in this process. And a, and a good way of doing that is to say, let's reduce cycle time. I was working with a major oil company, and we redesigned the process of drilling for oil in the Gulf of Mexico. We set a target, which nobody knew whether we could meet or not. It was just a stretch goal of cutting the process time in half, from many years to fewer years, to half the number. It was in years, by the way. Um, and they more than did it. But their initial, the design team's initial reaction was, that's impossible. You know, We work our butts off now to do it in the current time. There's no way we can do that the way we do it. Good, you're right. There's no way you can do it the way you do it. That's exactly the point. You have to completely rethink how you do it. Because maybe every step in the process doesn't have to be sequ sequential. Maybe some of them can be concurrent. And maybe when you look at the process, you find that nobody really owns the whole process. Everybody owns their little piece, and then they throw it back because it wasn't done right by the previous team, and things tend to you know, recycle and go around and around um, because nobody owns the whole process. So think about cycle time, think about the seven forms of waste, but also think about management forms of waste. And I, I don't have time to go through all that now, but just you know, look at these forms of management waste, because management does create waste, and sometimes more than is created on the shop floor at the first level. Uh, management creates waste by not doing a good job of making decisions themselves. They create rework. They, they create the loss of money by doing things that just aren't very smart, um, not using you know, their intellect uh, as they have uh, in making decisions. They, they create forms of waste. And by not empowering the people who are the world's greatest experts with their hands on, by not recognizing and respecting their expertise, you tend to create waste. So every quality problem creates waste, either stuff that has to be thrown out or stuff that has to be reworked. That's all, all waste. So look at the forms of waste, study your process, empower your people, and work on eliminating waste. Those are three additional principles. Let's come back for three more principles and we'll wrap it up.